Bob says it's time to start, so we need to get going. Hi, my name is Jan Dolman. Welcome back. Um, I trust that those who, of you, most of you, were here yesterday, and I were looking forward to another excellent presentation by our presenter, Dr. Skillen. Um, as you would recall, he is a PhD from Cornell, and you remember the importance of that from yesterday. Okay. Um, so without further ado, I give you Dr. Skillen. Thanks so much. All right, is the sound okay? All right. Well, thank you for coming back and a couple of new folks today. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to finish up uh, the presentation that I had yesterday. Uh, if you were one of my students at Calvin, you wouldn't necessarily be surprised that I didn't get through my lesson plan, but uh, it's one of the conceits that I can do that. And then, um, so I'll finish that up. I just need to say a, a few words about uh, the Forest Service, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Bureau of Land Management. And then we'll move on to what I take to be some of the most pressing issues with federal lands today, and I think for the, the next decade or two. And as we get to those, then we are going to be getting more into kind of things that you're hearing about in the news. So we'll talk a little bit about wildfire, um, which gets attention and particularly in uh, very bad years, uh, talk about climate change. And so feel free to ask questions, uh, interrupt me if you'd like. Uh, I'll maybe pause between issues in case you wanna uh, ask additional questions. And then I did prepare a few additional thoughts on uh, both Native American land issues and then also uh, some comments on water. So we'll get started. Uh, I, I finished most of what I wanted to say about the National Forest System and the National Forest Service yesterday, uh, how that developed, uh, and that the National Forests today are uh, 193 million acres. Most of that acreage, as with other federal land, is in the West, though there are by number significant uh, national forests in the East as well. Um, and here on this map were the the Weeks Act forests east of the Mississippi. Uh, and I, fin I ended here. The couple things I wanted to say, I think that would be helpful is I explained how the Forest Service mission went from timber production and some water quality protection to this multiple use mandate where it's to be all things to all people. And the Forest Service does everything from wilderness preservation to timber sales uh, and it's, and it really varies quite a bit by region. I mean, if you go to our national forests in Michigan, you're gonna find these forests are used almost exclusively for recreation, right? These are not areas with uh, oil and gas, with big timber production. And you'll find that varies in other regions. But what I thought would be helpful is to show you just this graph, which I think does capture um, something about the shift in the, the forest service work and the use of national forests. This is a graph showing the amount of timber harvested from the national forests in the 20th century up to about 2015. And what you'll see, this is in billion board feet, uh, quite a lot. You'll see that things were particularly quiet uh, really up through 1940, mid 1940s. And then all of a sudden this timber production skyrockets. And what you're seeing there is actually the Forest Service responding to veterans coming back from World War II and this explosion of home construction all over the United States. Most of that Eastern and Great Lakes timber had already been cut. Um, enormous amount of timber was coming off of private timber lands in the West, but now the Forest Service was at the center of US timber production. And during that period, if you look kind of 1940s, uh, before that dip in the around 1980, you'll see that the, yep, all right. Well, thanks. Uh, you'll see uh, the Forest Service, you know, at one point is at 12 billion board feet of timber a year. And the agency during that time, uh, their, their work was trying to maximize the amount of timber coming off these forest lands. And that meant kind of re-engineering forests so that they maximize timber growth to the detriment of a number of other resources. Uh, after there's a slump here in 1980, uh, goes way back up 
And then when you see what happens in the 1990s when timber harvesting collapses, that actually is responding to broader public demands. But a lot of what you're seeing there is the collapse of timber, federal timber harvesting in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Oregon, the Western slope of the Cascades in Oregon, Washington, and Northern California were producing 8 billion board feet of timber. And uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, labeled or listed uh, the, north, uh, the Northern spotted owl as a threatened species in 1990. And that listing, along with a few other things, basically shut down timber harvesting in the Pacific Northwest. So now, today, the Forest Service is producing two to three billion board feet a year. It's distributed around the country, but that dropping emphasis on timber has allowed, I think, space for some of these other uses and some of these other resource values to have priority. All right, so then the National Wildlife Refuge System. Uh, the system itself is fascinating, and the agency that manages it is even more curious. The first uh, National Wildlife Refuge, a different name at the time, was Pelican Island, created in 1903. This is a five-acre island, and it was created by Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, he asked his attorneys, do I have legal authority to create a wildlife refuge? And they said, no, sir. And he said, well, is there any law that prohibits me from doing it? They said, no. So he created it. Uh, and if you know anything about uh, Teddy Roosevelt and sort of his interests, this was a president who was an avid angler and hunter. When he finished, he left uh, the presidency, you know, he went on a safari in Africa and sent back 5,000 uh, trophies. So he was someone who really cared deeply about fish and game and was concerned about the loss of migratory birds. And one of the things that's important with fish and wildlife um, and really forest service as well is the significance of anglers and hunters in supporting the growth of these. Um, to those who don't hunt, it seems counterintuitive that you wanna spend lots of money protecting places for animals that you can then kill. Uh, but if that is something you're interested in, there was a lot of support and there continues to be financial support through things like the duck stamp program. So uh, hunters pay fees and that goes into habitat protection. Uh, today, the wildlife refuge system uh, has 568 units and 93 million acres. I should have said at the outset, as with all of these systems, a disproportionate number of these acres are in Alaska. So the ones, the wildlife refuges in the east tend to be quite small. Uh, if you go to Alaska, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is 19 million acres. So this is 10 Yellowstones, one wildlife refuge. One thing to note, if you look at this map, is the arrangement of these wildlife refuges. You'll see that they're kind of clustered in Florida, coastal Florida, and then up the east coast. You'll see uh, faintly, you can make out kind of a line that follows the Mississippi River. You see the West Coast and then clustering up in North Dakota. And the reason for that is many of these refuges were established for migratory birds. So you're seeing the Atlantic Flyway, uh, Mississippi Flyway, and the Pacific Flyway. And these wildlife refuges are critically important to migratory birds for a lot of reasons, but particularly because wetlands are one of the least represented landscapes left in the US. Wetlands tend to have rich soils. So for the 19th century, early 20th century, wetlands were drained all over the United States. And so many of these wildlife refuges provide the absolutely necessary stopping places for migratory birds. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service's mission to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. It sounds quite a bit uh, more like the Park Service mission than the Forest Service. Um, so its primary purpose is protection of habitat that's necessary for wildlife, plants, and fish. Uh, but the Fish and Wildlife Service well, the, the history of the way these refuges have been set up 
is that in many cases, to be established, to get political support, they've remained open to a number of other extractive uses. So you can find uh, national wildlife refuges that have oil and gas drilling in them. Um, and in fact, this is the battle over the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, 19 million acres. The very northern part of that, called the 1002 area, is still open, potentially open to oil and gas drilling. Where I lived in uh, south, south central, southwestern Oregon, I was near the Klamath Wildlife Refuge and a couple of others. And those are odd because to get support, the wildlife refuge was established explicitly to protect wildlife and farming. Oh, so you go into this wildlife refuge and you have row crops. Um, and then next to that are wetlands with migratory birds. But these are the kinds of places that if you wanna do a tour of the wildlife refuges, definitely check out the migratory bird schedule because even more than the other units, they're more interesting at some parts at some times of the year than others. Um, now, I said the agency that manages these, the Fish and Wildlife Service, is particularly interesting. And that's because it's an agency that was created in 1940 by merging the Bureau of Fisheries and the U.S. Biological Survey. Now, U.S. Biological Survey. They did a lot more than surveying. Their primary work was killing predators. So this was an agency that uh, killed millions not exaggerating, millions of wolves, mountain lions, coyotes, bear. And it was largely to protect livestock interests. And so this agency, that that was their, their roots, is now the agency that oversees uh, the National Wildlife Refuges. It also is now the agency that implements threatened and endangered species protection in all of kind of the terrestrial US. So if it's not marine, this is the agency that lists plants and animals as threatened or endangered, um, that regulates their use, that prosecutes crimes. And so this, the agency's budget is, uh, I mean, really about a quarter of it goes to the wildlife refuges and the rest of it goes to things like listing species. They have forensic labs where they investigate crimes. Uh, they do a lot of research on wildlife and they give a lot of grants to states and municipal governments in order to protect habitat around the country. Uh, and I just picked a few pretty pictures. Uh, up there on the left is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It is home to the largest herd of migratory caribou in the world. And that is primarily the battle over oil drilling there. <laughs> I would say the practical question is whether oil drilling will harm the caribou. I think what animates this debate is less that particular animal and more the idea that there's currently this 19 million acre wilderness in Northern Alaska, that if we start building roads and putting in drill pads, will be changed forever. And then on the right there, also in Alaska, uh, you see some bears. And by the way, did anyone follow Fat Bear Week? Oh, uh, too few of you. If you don't know Fat Bear Week, look it up. The Park Service on the Kenai Peninsula sets up webcams. And in the fall, um, you can go on the webcams and you watch these grizzly bears that are hunting uh, salmon. So you've seen the images. It's a grizzly bear on top of a small waterfall and there's a salmon jumping into its mouth. That's on the Kenai Peninsula. And they have a bracket system. So over the course of a week, you get to vote on which bear is the fattest. <laughs> and this year, I'm pleased to say that my pick, 747, uh, won, but there was scandal this year. Yes, there were voting irregularities, and someone, no, seriously, and someone set up a, some bots that were stuffing the ballot, and so we had to step in and make sure that we had, you know, electoral integrity when it comes to fat bear week. All right, then, uh, finally, the national system of public lands. Uh, maybe you already see what's a little confusing about this. The national system of public lands are a system of public lands, but I've used that phrase to refer to intermittently to all federal lands. 
What's important about that is these are lands that in essence don't have a name. They're, they're not a system the way the others are a system. And the primary reason for that is because these are the lands, if you were here yesterday, that I talked about no one wanting. And these were the lands that up through the mid 20th century, these were desert lands that no one was clamoring to own. Environmentalists, even the 1960s, weren't out waxing eloquent about deserts. They were in the Sierra, in the mountains, you know, on the coasts. And so these lands, rather than having been set aside by Congress, as all of the other lands I've talked about have been, these are the lands that are part of the original public domain. These are the lands that just still happen to be in federal ownership. And that's why their distribution, uh, the public lands are the, um, what is that, gold tan color? Uh, and you'll see they're concentrated in Nevada. Um, up in Alaska, in very northern Alaska, is the National Petroleum Reserve. But then you see their lands too, uh, kind of on the west slope of the Rockies, down in New Mexico, um, Southern California and the California desert. And so uh, two things that that leads to, the first is that uh, these lands are lands that really until, well, even today, if you, back when you all used Rand McNally road atlases, I mean, now you probably just use Google Maps. Uh, but with Rand McNally road atlases, these lands would not have appeared on them. The national parks, national forests, wildlife refuges would have been there. These would not have shown up. And in fact, they're not organized in discrete units like a park or a forest. They're just the public lands. And your experience probably of going into a park is there's a pretty sign or national forest welcome to. Public lands, you probably don't know when you're driving through them, except for some special areas. But if you're driving through Nevada, it's more likely than not that you're driving through this area of public lands. So even the way that uh, the lands are administered, um, the agency that administers them is just organized by state and by district. So it's not, again, a, I don't know, the... Uh, the, the Sequoia public lands, actually that wouldn't make sense, mostly desert. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management or the public lands do include some rich timberland in Western Oregon and that's entirely an accident. Uh, the, the Bureau of Land Management, the agency that oversees these lands and it's now 244 million acres. Oh, if you ask, I can repeat it. I noticed that all the BIA lands were also included as being public lands. So, uh, and sorry, I should have clarified. The reason for that is um, when it says managed by the Bureau of Land Management, um, most of the BIA land that you see is held by the federal government. So at one level, it's federal land, but it's held in trust for Indian tribes. And the reason why it's on this map is that um, the federal government, in many cases, is then managing the minerals or managing the forests. So it's on this map, which is Bureau of Land Management, because BLM oversees all mineral leasing and patenting on these lands. How well that's administered, well, that, another story, but that's why it's, it, it, they probably, they're not public in the same sense, but they are, they kind of fall within this system of management. Thanks. Um, so the, the Bureau of Land Management was created in 1946 by merging the General Land Office, if you remember them from yesterday, they were the, the nation's surveyor and realtor, with the U.S. Grazing Service. Um, and the U.S. Grazing Service was a poor agency that got beaten up badly. It only existed 1934 to 1946. Um, and it got into some spats with Western ranchers, and it was kind of a shell of itself when it was merged. But this, what you're seeing here, is the agency's first uh, emblem, released in 1954. And I think this captures pretty well what the agency was about, its mission, its mandate, its values. 
what you see in this are um, from the bottom to the top, a miner, a rancher, an engineer, a logger, and a surveyor. So when the, the Bureau of Land Management was formed, uh, its job was still really focused on how do we get resources into the economy. In fact, it wasn't until 1976 that Congress, um, well, that Congress finally ended homesteading um, and repealed these settlement laws. I mean, by 1946, there was very little happening, but the point is when the agency was formed, there wasn't even any co congressional commitment to keeping these lands in federal ownership. Uh, now, over time, just like the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management has shifted, it hasn't expanded as far, but to a multiple use mission to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of public lands for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations. You notice a modest shift in the emblem uh, that really overstated, I think, a shift in the agency's emphasis. The first thing that's wrong with this is that there's a tree, a river, and a mountain instead of just a desert. But the more importantly, you see that we go from an agency focused on resource development. If you look at those figures to the left are Conestoga wagons and to, right, to the right is an oil refinery, um, to this kind of beautiful picture that looks a little more like national parks, national forests. Um, the agency has made this shift in places. And I think if you look at uh, the employees that they, uh, the people they employ today, uh, it will look in the distribution very much like the Forest Service. Uh, but if we look at the revenue that the agency brings in, uh, first it would be mineral development, oil, gas, and coal leasing, um, then grazing. So it still is a landscape that I would say, I would call a working landscape. Um, they have some areas of critical environmental concern. They have some wilderness areas. But you can think of these public lands as they're probably being used for something of economic value. And the most widely distributed is livestock grazing. Um, now, but this reminds me, they do have curious things that only the BLM would have. If you look at the bottom center picture, any guesses as to where that is? It's a Black Rock Desert in Nevada. Anyone heard of Burning Man? Yeah, so that's that's on public lands managed by the BLM. Uh, Burning Man is a gathering, now it's up to about 70,000 people uh, that show up for an expression of creativity and freedom. It's wild um, and that's a longer story. But so there are curious things that happen there. Also the, the Bureau of Land Management you might hear about because uh, they're the agency that most often deals with wild horses, wild horses and burrows. Um, those are feral animals. Let's say today they're wild, but they come from uh, feral horses from the Spanish, and they have no significant predators, and these horse herds grow in number. And as a result, they not only can degrade the range, but they compete with other wildlife and they compete with livestock for forage. And since 1969, the Bureau of Land Management has, to the, for the most part, uh, not euthanize them, so it no longer calls them. Instead, it rounds them up, it puts them in holding facilities, and then it sends them around the country so that you can adopt them. So if you would like to adopt a wild horse, they have 54,000 available. Um, and then there are another, I don't know, I think 60,000 out on the public lands. But let me just say, the reason why you should like public lands, and this is speaking as someone who's interested partly for academic reasons, but also just recreationally, is that these are the lands where you really can go wherever you want and do whatever you want. You know, if you go to a national park, there's gonna be some nice velvet ropes and cordons and a nice paved trail. They're set up to handle millions of visitors. If you go to public lands, um, there probably won't be signs, but just wander out there. I was once with a class, we were out in Eastern Oregon, and we were meeting with a range manager. We were out on uh, a, a grazing allotment that is an area of land leased to a, permitted to a one ranch. And it was 540,000 acres. I mean, just that's one ranch. And um, we're out there and one of my students from Michigan asks the manager, 
well, I see that you use this for grazing, but do you also have places where you can camp? And the manager says, sure. Student asks where. Manager says, well, wherever you want. Um, and I've gone on, um, you know, ride alongs with employees all over the place. And when you, you ride on the public lands, you're gonna see everything. I mean, I did one ride in Arizona, you know, it was uh, a militia training, a family reunion, kind of retirees in their uh, RV, father and son backpacking, and it kind of all happens in this wild landscape. I'll add that the Bureau of Land Management has one law enforcement ranger per million acres. So <laughs> you shouldn't do anything illegal, but if you do, you won't get caught, I promise. Um, now, the last system that I wanna mention is the National Wilderness Preservation System. And what could be a little confusing is this is not a separate system of lands and area. Uh, wilderness, officially designated wilderness, is a designation that Congress puts on lands, and there are wilderness areas in all four of the systems. So Park Service, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and Bureau of Land Management all manage wilderness areas. Uh, you can see at the bottom, there are 100, or 803 and about 112 million acres. So 5% of the United States is designated wilderness. And the big ones you can see, the kind of orange there, uh, there are many smaller ones in the east that you can't see. And these are significant because the Wilderness Act of 1964 uh, says that wilderness is a place where humans should visit but not remain. They're lands that are meant to be left untrammeled by human beings. And this is the most restricted class of federal lands. Generally speaking, in a wilderness area, uh, well, there shouldn't be, but the agencies can't build structures. Um, you're not allowed to use mechanized equipment of any kind. So even if you go out in a wilderness area, the trail crews are using crosscut saws, not chainsaws. They're using block and tackle, not heavy equipment. And so these are areas that if you want some solitude, there are a few wildernesses that are kind of crowded, but if you want solitude, I can point you to some areas uh, that I think are spectacular and very, very quiet. I would also say that these wilderness areas then from the standpoint of biodiversity, thinking about preserving animals in particular, these form the kind of core uh, of that restriction. And it's also, these, these are basically some of the few areas where if a wildfire starts naturally, the agencies can let it burn. All right, so moving on. Oh, any questions about that? And then I'll move on to issues. The follow instructions. So what percentage of the total land mass of the U.S. does 112 million represent? 5%. 5%. So those brown areas, brownish or tan areas? Yeah, these are all the wilderness areas. So those represent 5%. Right. And then even though it's a little harder to see uh, from where you're sitting, if I get up real close, you know, there are little dots throughout yeah. here in the east. You know, by the, by 1964, there weren't a lot of big tracts of land that were undeveloped. When you first said that, I thought that sounded substantial. As it sunk in, I'm thinking, what? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was talking about... Not much. Yeah, I, if, um, if you noticed, at the start of the Biden administration, they made a big deal of signing on to a pledge to protect... 30% of American land and water by 2030, um, putting it into protected status. And uh, the federal lands can achieve a lot of that. In other words, outside of wilderness, parks, parts of forests um, will serve a lot of that. In fact, I would say that's going to anchor, if the U.S. succeeds, this will kind of be the foundation for it. Uh, in addition to this, in the case of the U.S. Forest Service, um, they have an additional uh, 50, 58 or 59 million acres of land that are surveyed roadless. And that's functionally the same thing. I mean, someone can bring a mountain bike in there, but if you don't have roads, you don't have development, um, you don't have uh, a lot of invasive species delivery, 
Uh, and so that additional amount, you know, brings us up to seven, seven and a half percent. Uh, that those roadless areas uh, under the law could be developed, but there is an administrative moratorium on that uh, so that they remain sort of kind of managed as wilderness. The big uh, battle over that during the Trump administration was in the Tongass National Forest. And the Tongass down here is, this is temperate rainforest. Um, if, you, if you look up uh, Misty Fjords National Monument, uh, it's, it's often referred to as the Yosemite of Alaska, these deep fjords carved out of the rock. But this is all temperate rainforest and incredibly rich from a timber perspective. And so some of that is not wilderness, not national monument, it's just technically roadless. And so the Trump administration opened that to road building and timber harvesting, the Biden administration reversed that. And so we're gonna see a lot of that, you know, where there is that discretion within a landscape, it's gonna depend entirely on who's in the White House and who controls Congress. Is there ever going to be a way to settle that discussion where an area that's protected is protected and it's not up to the whims of which parties in the White House mm -hmm. or anything else? Is there ever going to be a way or yep. is that, are we just going to watch these beautiful spaces shrink due to ignorance and, and greed for resources? Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. I would say that um, probably the, the most protected land in the U.S. from one perspective is New York state land, the Adirondacks and the Catskills. And the reason for that is protection of that land is written into the state constitution. So not only would, you know, that voters would need to amend the constitution requiring a supermajority vote, uh, for federal land, you know, the, the wilderness areas are about as protected as you're going to get. And the reason for that is the wilderness areas, like the national parks, have a really strong uh, constituency. I mean, really powerful um, political supporters. So any land that moves into the wilderness system is, I mean, nothing's guaranteed, but it's really safe. Um, land like the roadless areas are going to be up to the whims, and the reason for of um, particularly of the president, and the reason for that is more secure protection would have to come through Congress. Once Congress establishes some of these land areas, it's a lot harder because it's a lot harder to get Congress to do anything. I mean, Congress today, compared to historically, um, really anything before of the 20th century is remarkably unproductive just in the volume of, of bills they pass. So um, Congress continues to add to the wilderness system. Uh, and the reason for that is that wilderness decisions are generally made at the request of, of the state delegations. So, you know, if the whole Colorado delegation says we want a wilderness area, the rest of Congress will probably go along with it. Uh, but as far as some kind of broader national recategorization, um, Congress right now, I'm going to say never, never, but Congress right now is not looking very promising as a place to make big changes. Uh, I mean, I'll add that Congress, most, most, almost all of the basic environmental laws that we know today, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Wilderness Act, uh, almost all of them were passed between 1969 and 1980. And that was a period where environmental issues were bipartisan. Richard Nixon signed, I don't know, some of the biggest ones, Clean Air, Clean Water Act. Um, and so after 1980, environmental issues became far more partisan. And after 1980, Congress really stopped passing significant new environmental legislation with one exception of the Clean Air Act, uh, it's largely kind of silent. And so much of environmental policy broadly in the United States is then um, altered or it develops in the courts or in the agencies. 
Um, but hey, people, we could have a functioning Congress again. If I had the a, a path of how we're going to get there, I'd let you know, but it could happen. I haven't given up hope, though I'm discouraged. All right, so I want to move on. Oh, yeah. Just one, just one quick comment. Yeah. You haven't talked at all about invasive species. I'm thinking of what happened to the Douglas fir out in the Rocky Mountains. They're almost gone. And now we've got the agalids coming in and the hemlocks are disappearing. And I hope we're going to do something in, within these park systems and things that will allow us to prevent these invasions of the invasive species coming from overseas, coming ballast water, coming all kinds of ways. It isn't it isn't big animals. It isn't those we're worried about. It's the viruses and, and fungi and different things they carry in. I know that I've been to Colorado and, and driven for miles and miles through the back roads of mountains. And the mountains are just covered with gray, dead Douglas fir. Yeah, there. Uh, Colorado has been hit hard with the spruce budworm and the pine bark beetle, and um, we have in some of those cases, it's uh, some cases we have invasive species. Others, it's that uh, warmer winters and a lack of wildfire have allowed, you know, historically present pests uh, to explode in population, but invasive species. I would consider it to be the second biggest threat to protecting biodiversity after habitat loss. And um, it's something that the agencies wrestle with. And I don't plan to talk a lot about it, but it, I'll mention it in relation to a number of these big issues. So thanks so much. Uh, all right, so for the big issues, uh, and if we don't get through all of them, that's okay. Um, I, can, I can send you some notes. But I'll put ownership, and I don't know that it's the hottest issue, meaning I don't know that it's going to get the most attention, but it's such a basic issue. And we do continue to argue about whether the federal government should own land and how much it should own. Um, most people are okay with the national parks. But beyond that, uh, there still is real support uh, in some circles to significantly reduce uh, the amount of land the federal government Owns. Uh, and then also mention Native American rights. Recreation, which is a huge issue, is going to be a huge issue. Uh, climate change, and I'm going to lump a few other things under that biodiversity, wildfire. Uh, energy is going to continue to be a massive issue. And then the bonus topic here is wild, is water. So ownership. I said yesterday that the Constitution, not everyone believes that this is the right interpretation. But the Constitution, I think, is very clear that Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. The Supreme Court has affirmed that this is essentially an unlimited authority. Um, in fact, if we look at some of the cases uh, in which the court has reaffirmed this uh, Light v. United States, 1911, the government has, with respect to its own land, the rights of an ordinary proprietor to maintain its possession and to prosecute trespassers. It may deal with such lands precisely as an ordinary individual may deal with its, his farming property. And then, of course, on top of that, the federal government is also the sovereign, so it makes the rules of this. Um, but on the face of it, it would seem really clear. Um, but over the over time, there have been waves of resistance to federal ownership. Um, very often in the Western United States, for obvious reasons, because Westerners have more federal land. Sometimes they're frustrated with the way it's managed. But I'll just mention three of these waves. Uh, one of them, the Sagebrush Rebellion, 1979 to 1982. Uh, this was a period where Western states, uh, many Western legislatures, passed laws uh, claiming ownership over the federal land, sorry, ownership over the public domain lands within their states. So basically everything managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And they made a variety of arguments for that. Uh, but at root, what this also was, was a broader frustration with government itself, right? Frustration just sort of with the size and scope of government. Um, oh, I should have put a picture in there of Ronald Reagan, who, when he ran for president, proudly claimed he was a sagebrush rebel, 
um, and that he would, he would help Westerners. He appointed uh, an interior secretary, James Watt, uh, who was sympathetic, but what Reagan and Watt understood is that what Westerners were really frustrated with was not who held title to the land. They were frustrated over who got to control its use. And so this uh, rebellion largely fizzled after Reagan and Watt kind of said, Watt actually met with the governors and he says, you know, whatever you want, you can do on the land. And, you know, the rebellion quieted. Um, but this re there was a resurgence of this in the 90s. And if we think about the Sagebrush Rebellion, it, it was a, uh, really a state's rights rebellion. It was the Western states saying no to big federal government. The next rebellion, I'll call it the War for the West in the 90s, um, this actually expanded. It was Westerners still making states' rights arguments, but there were also Westerners who were fighting over what they claimed were private property rights to federal lands that weren't being acknowledged. Um, and we also had a, a variety of other sort of constitutional issues. And this, I, I, we saw a shift in this period in that uh, this is also when the Sagebrush Rebellion really became kind of a national rebellion. There was broad support across the nation, and it really was a collective frustration with the federal government as such, its size, its scope. And so the reason that this had more traction and lasted longer is it was Westerners fighting for greater say and control of federal lands, but they were joined by actually gun rights uh, organizations concerned about Second Amendment. They were joined by private property interests. Uh, and uh, this is also the period in which you saw the rise of what I would saw, call what patriotic militias. So this, this is when the, the militia movement that you've heard of today, Oath Keepers, 3% Patriots, that kind of forms, that movement takes shape in the 90s. And you'll be proud to know that the Michigan militia, right up in front, Norm Olson. Um, the difference in the 90s, I'll say, is that when militia leaders went and testified before Congress, Republicans and Democrats both thought their conspiracy theories about black helicopters and weather changing machines were junk. Um, today, I think we have more problem agreeing on some basic realities. But, and then today, I would say the Patriot Rebellion, I'll call it, uh, 2010 to the present. And what does this have to do with federal lands, you ask? Well, the Patriot Rebellion, um, you can connect it. I think of it as the armed wing of the Tea Party. Uh, it really was, how are we going to get government back to its founding purpose and size? How are we going to roll government back? And the reason it's so important for federal lands is because in the West, the most significant, the most visible symbol of federal power is this vast estate of federal lands. And so we saw in the last 10 years, significant, um, I would say mostly potential for violence or near violence and violence over federal lands. Um, you may or may not remember this guy, Cliven Bundy. Uh, he's a rancher in Nevada. Uh, he had been grazing his cattle illegally for 20 years. And the Bureau of, uh, sorry, on public lands, the Bureau of Land Management went in to remove his cattle and Clive and Bundy uh, called for support. Uh, he was joined by a couple thousand sort of unorganized militias, basically um, militia groups. And they had a period of tense standoff at gunpoint with FBI, Bureau of Land Management, law enforcement rangers. Uh, and that situation only I wouldn't say resolved, it diffused only because the federal government stood down and Clive and Bundy's cattle are still grazing on public lands. But Bundy became a spokesperson for this movement. He's arguing that, actually, I think at one point he says he doesn't even recognize the federal government as existing. So he would say, the federal government doesn't have any authority over federal lands. This should all be in the hands of the states and the counties. And then two years later, you might have remembered uh, two of his sons, Ammon and Ryan Bundy, uh, with a few hundred people, uh, occupied the Malheur Wildlife Refuge in Oregon. This was another standoff. This time the FBI just stayed at a distance 
let this kind of go on and on. People were at the refuge. Uh, and if you saw images from the time, I should have put some in. Uh, it wasn't just people in tactical gear and rifles, but you also saw people dressed up as King George, as Revolutionary War soldiers. I mean, this really was about, we're going to have a new revolution that brings back the right size and right kind of federal government. Uh, that one ended uh, tragically. The FBI uh, knew that the leaders of this occupation were traveling some back roads in Oregon where there wasn't cell coverage. So they set up a roadblock and arrested them. And in the process, um, I think it was Oregon state troopers shot and killed uh, one of the leaders, LaVoy Finicum. Okay, this is where it gets interesting. Uh, Ammon Bundy, Ryan Bundy were arrested. They were imprisoned. They were acquitted on all charges. Cliven Bundy was acquitted. Um, and they're really moving uh, in this, I mean, they, they continue to foment a kind of rebellion against the size and scope of federal government, but specifically federal land ownership. So in 2016 and 2020, the Republican National Platform included a pledge to pass legislation that would transfer ownership of not all, but a significant portion of federal lands to the states and counties. Um, and that is why, I mean, it was odd to me, but, you know, when Marco Rubio, senator from Florida, was running in the Republican primary, he came to Michigan and denounced federal lands. I think he said something like, why does the federal government need so much land? They only need three acres, one for Elvis, one for Tupac, I don't know. But why is a senator from Florida denouncing federal land ownership? Because it's become part of a certain coalition that is anti-government. Uh, I'm not saying all Republicans are. I'm simply saying it's within this coalition. Uh, and so I'll say that I think to date, there really hasn't been successful, a large successful land transfer. Um, Chaffetz um, from Utah, uh, probably 2017, introduced a bill that would have taken 3 million acres of public lands in Utah that the Bureau of Land Management had said were surplus and not really useful to manage. He proposed uh, selling those and his own party shot it down. And the reason why, so this is why I think it'll remain a political issue, but the reason why I think we won't see massive drops in federal land ownership is because even if you're for the idea in principle, as soon as the federal government identifies particular acres, well, it turns out hunting, fishing, hiking, those aren't partisan. And so when people see that their favorite part of the public lands are gonna be removed, then they'll mobilize. All right, the other ownership question that I think we are seeing more movement on though is questions of ownership or title related to Native Americans. I said yesterday, and this is the map of linguistic stocks of Indian tribes in the US, and the federal government between 1778 and 1868 signed 368 treaties with Indian nations. Those treaties are what moved um, or took moved title from the tribes to the federal government. And the treaties themselves were rife with problems, not least was coercion, uh, deception. But even where that wasn't the case, the treaties have not been honored. Um, there have been ongoing disputes about them, and we're beginning to see, I think, some meaningful developments that I'll say something about. Uh, so uh, when the federal government finished signing treaties, it said we're done signing treaties, then Congress decided that the policy of the federal government was assimilation. The policy was to erase Indian tribes as sovereign nations and just assimilate them into Euro-American culture. The Dawes Severalty Act of 1887 uh, set out specifically to do this. And again, the goal was dismantling tribal, that is communal land ownership. If you go back and read the documents of the time, um, already this was seen as suspect. I mean, as sort of, I mean, we would say communist. There was this suspicion of this communally owned land and it went against the grain of all American settlement laws, which were about how do we get 160 acres into private ownership? Uh, and as I said, to assimilate Indians into Euro-American culture. 
Um, the way this worked is that the federal government, um, I should have put it on the slide, the federal government pursued allotment of Indian reservations. So what that meant is the federal government would allow every man, woman, and child to take 40, 80, or 160 acres of land. So you, you now have your own plot. There's no more communal land. And surplus land. So if there was more land than necessary for that, surplus land, the federal government either created, turned into national forests, sold to non-Indians, uh, but basically divested the tribes of that land. And it's led to maps like this, I'm sorry I didn't put the area, where you have these landscapes, you see the yellow here is tribally owned, um, the tan is reserved, so federal ownership, but managed in trust for the tribes, um, allotted land, so this would be Indians who own individual lots, and then fee would be land that was sold or by the federal government or later the tribes. And this is actually an interesting place where right now the Interior Department is working with tribes to try to address. There's no one's taking land, uh, but what the federal government is doing is working with tribal members so that to make it easier to take allotted land. So in private tribal or private ownership by an Indian owner and transfer that into the reservation or if the tribe buys fee simple land in here, transferring it to the reservation. So this is one place where we're actually seeing not, not huge acreage, but we're seeing some rebuilding of tribal land, of Indian reservations. Um, then the, the second blow, that was the first blow, and then we'll need to address the second blow, was Indian termination. Uh, in 1953, Congress passed the Indian termination well, it was a policy, uh, not strictly an act. And the goal then was to no longer have government to government relationships with tribes. So instead of having a sovereign Indian tribe that the federal government worked with, the federal government said, you're at a point where you no longer need recognition, you no longer need federal support. So you're no longer a tribe. Uh, basically saying you're now just American citizens like everyone else. Uh, and this led to, I mean, just devastating results in a lot of areas. And during the 1960s, there was a revival of through the American Indian movement. And uh, by the 1970s, the federal government had, in essence, discredited its own policy. And so one of the things that we're seeing now is uh, the federal government doing more and more either to uh, tribes are regaining recognition as sovereign nations, government to government negotiations. Uh, and we also see agencies like the Forest Service are doing a lot more to consult with the tribes over management of the national forests, if those forests were part of its aborig their aboriginal land. And then the Forest Service, Park Service are also uh, doing things like they're contracting with tribal companies to work on the land. And so this isn't about change of ownership, but there is change in a sense of ownership, right? A recognition that perhaps the tribe whose Aboriginal land this is should have greater influence or greater say. Um, and so we do have what I mentioned, restoring tribal ownership, co-management contracting, tribal consultation. And then the, the last one that's probably the most thorny is on federal land working to protect uh, really significant cultural sites, sacred sites. If you've heard of Bears Ears National Monument, that's uh, a configuration of uh, Bears Ears itself is a sacred site. Uh, this is particularly thorny in both directions. Uh, the agencies tend not to want to lose their discretion in how to manage that site. But the, on the side of the tribes, in, in some cases, the tribes don't want to tell the federal government where the sacred sites are because they don't want them mapped, right? They don't want everyone to know this is where you can go. Uh, so here's just a quick case study. And this is from uh, very close to where I lived in South Central, Southwestern Oregon. The Klamath tribes, 
The Klamath tribes actually were the merger of three other tribes, Klamath, Modoc, Yahuskin. And prior to 1864, uh, these tribes basically owned or had title to most of Oregon, 22 million acres. <clears throat> and in the treaty, they ceded 20 million acres to the federal government and retained 2 million. And they retained traditional hunting and fishing rights uh, to, that, to the 2 million acres. But following the story I just told, the federal government terminated the Klamath tribes as a sovereign nation in 1954. They allotted the Klamath tribal land. The surplus land was turned into the Klamath National Forest. Most of that tribal land was sold to non-Indians. And uh, the tribe really struggled uh, because now there's still a cultural identity, but well, there's no land that would help define that. There's no uh, government of their own that would help define that. And one of the interesting things is the way that the Klamath tribes began to rebuild, if you look at uh, point number three here, is that um, in the 1970s through 2000, the courts increasingly uh, honored or recognized those remaining hunting and fishing rights. And the reason that's important is because the Klamath tribes, in the case of fishing, uh, the Klamath tribes went to court and said, our treaty gives us rights to fish in the Klamath River, but farmers are taking so much water from the river that all the fish are dying. And the court said, well, yeah, it really doesn't make sense. You don't really have a right to fish if there's no river left for the fish. And so the Klamath tribes were able to uh, have some leverage, the same thing with hunting on the national forests. And in 1986, the Klamath tribes uh, regained identification and sovereignty, but then this is complicated. It's a sovereign tribe with no territory. And over the last you know, 35 years, uh, this is a tribe that's been working through that allotment program to try to rebuild uh, territory and also to begin to assert greater management control over that 2 million acres over which it retained hunting and fishing rights. I know that story is probably told too quickly, um, but, so I'll, but I'll stop here on ownership. Uh, any questions on whether it's European American objections to ownership or Indian objections? Yeah. Do, do other ranchers ups, be upset that one group of people get to graze all their cattle on so much land for free and the other people don't have access? I would, I would think that there's a, a conflict among ranchers just to say, well, how can you take so much for your cattle and the rest of us don't have any? I mean, why why should these guys have free grazing? The rest of Americans don't get to do that. It seems like it's pretty greedy. Um, yeah, what I would say is, um, and I, this, this is really fascinating to me, um, the ranchers who, the, the way that grazing is allocated, grazing permits, is that a rancher has to own what's called base property. So that's land or water rights that they can use to sustain their livestock in the non-grazing season, so over the winter. And so what that means is that the way it's allocated is if you own this you know, thousand acres of private property, you're the one who's gonna get a permit to that surrounding land. And what makes it complicated is that's not a legal right. It's not a, you don't have a property right to that, but it's so embedded historically to the point where the rancher goes to the bank to get a loan to, to buy another ranch. The bank will appraise that ranch, including the value of grazing public lands. So even though it's not private property, it's bought and sold all the time as private property. And so that's where, um, there actually isn't so much, uh, and, it, and it's long enough established, there isn't so much a controversy over who gets grazing on a particular area. What there is more controversy over is who gets water uh, to grow the hay, to feed the cattle in the winter, 
And uh, I was saying yesterday, you know, with water rights, because they're based on seniority, but not all of that seniority has been worked out legally. That's where you have a lot of, um, yeah, really contentious battles. And particularly, you know, the, the Southwest has been in drought basically for 20 years. So all of these battles are coming to a head. Where that involves the tribes is, um, and this has been a point of real bitterness between white and Indian uh, ranchers, but also ranchers and the tribes, is that where the courts have recognized tribal water rights, the courts have said their rights are from time immemorial. So Cliven Bundy says, hey, my people, they established water rights in 1864. Well, okay, but you know, well, he's not in the Klamath area, but the Klamath tribe's water rights go back to the beginning of time. And because those rights have only been recently reasserted, it has kind of really shaken some of these relationships because ranchers thought they were arguing with one group of people, you know, among themselves. And now you have a new party coming to that and actually trumping those claims. Yeah. So if you take this to its natural conclusion 100 years from now, if uh, all the tribes get what they need, does the United States look like uh, Swiss cheese, where you have all these territories that are independent sovereign lands, or do they become like a, another party within the United States, like the Republicans, Democrats, and Indians, that you got to yeah. you know, have that kind of, what does it look like 100 years from now? Yeah. Oh, boy, 100 years is too long for me, but I could, I could maybe think 50. I mean, what I would say is, you know, if you look at the, the, remember the map of the allotments, the total areas that where this will happen, namely that uh, Indian sovereign territory will be restored is relatively small. So it won't all of a sudden be, you know, that huge swaths of the West become sovereign Indian territory. But even there, and this is such, um, it's really complicated law, even there, the, the sovereignty of, of the tribe is limited. And what I mean by that is the federal government still holds the land in trust. So the federal government still has ultimate say over, um, you know, mineral extraction, timber. And then the Bureau of Indian Affairs is actually responsible for education, health care, so the sovereignty of the tribe is really the ability to do things um, self-government. So that would include uh, their own police. So they have, you know, police jurisdictions. Um, it would be sovereignty to manage their own zoning. I mean, this is why the issue of Indian casinos all over the country, because on the reservation, the tribe isn't bound by state law. So they can have casinos where outside the reservations in many states you can't. So it's still, it doesn't look like, you know, completely separate nations, the way we would think of nation states. It becomes quasi self-governing communities in the West. And the scale of that, um, I don't know, but I don't think we're gonna see, you know, just sort of huge areas. Um, and I would say, you know, one of the struggles for many of the tribes, if they're trying to recover their, um, you know, a cultural identity that was based on a particular way of living on a piece of land, that's a culture that's, um, I mean, it's hard to just recreate out of intent if the underlying practices that sustain the culture no longer exist. Um, this, this analogy probably will work, is probably terrible. But I mean, you know, we're in West Michigan and, and you sort of think, well, you know, how can, how can we at Calvin or at Hope really sustain the Dutch culture of these institutions founding? Well, it, it's hard because the, the scaffolding that made that culture what it was has all changed. Um, and so I think for many of the tribes, this idea of regaining territory is really about how do we create a space, not so much so that we don't answer to other governments, but how do we create a space where we can reenact historical relationships to the land 
that were essential to kind of cultural identity. I don't know if you wanted to say more about that. Okay. We have a question from Karen. Um, oh. I had read that there are large farm areas in the West that are owned internationally to grow crops, such as alfalfa for livestock feed, that then gets exported back to the owning country to feed people livestock, allowing that country to conserve their water. Yet Americans are suffering from water limitation and hardship because these farms are allowed to draw unlimited water quantity to water their farms. What information do you have about this situation? So it really yeah. relates to land ownership and water rights. Yeah, what I would say, and this is not an, an area that I um, have expertise in because it's not really federal land. What I would say is my, my guess is that's mostly California. Um, and, and there it's not just uh, foreign companies, it's uh, as with the Midwest, there's a lot of corporate farming. You know, a lot of this agricultural land, even vineyards in the Central Valley that are corporately owned. I mean, they're, they're owned by hedge funds. They're owned by, um, as opposed to family farms. So if you have um, uh, foreign companies owning land and exporting that, uh, I can appreciate the frustration. But there, even those companies would, would fall under state water law. So they can't just take as much as they want. They have to buy land with water rights or buy water rights. And that's why until I think 2015, maybe what this question refers to is since California didn't regulate groundwater at all, and there was no regulation, even in a state with that little water. Um, so these in the Central Valley, Coachella Valley and Imperial Valley, I mean, farms were just pumping groundwater limitlessly. And yeah, if you're looking at water scarcity and you're seeing it wander across the ocean, we think that's pretty frustrating. Um, I'll add, it's sort of tangentially related that one of the really interesting dynamics that I've seen in many parts of the West, um, Eastern Oregon and Washington, that the, the Great Basin and the Columbia Plateau, so everything from the Cascade Mountains to the Rockies, uh, you know, it's it's everything from cold desert because it's high elevation to really hot desert, say down in Nevada, and it's a hard place to make a living ranching. I mean, it's really hard. I had mentioned in Nevada there are places you need 150 acres per cow and calf. So if you want to run 1,200 head of cow, do the math. That's just a massive amount of land, and you cannot compete economically with. Kansas, Iowa, et cetera. So one of the really interesting dynamics is farmers say in, near or in Oregon where I lived, or I've seen this in parts of Colorado, have recognized that if they wanna make a living, they have to find um, value added, right? They have to find a niche market where people will pay more for their beef. And so there's been a significant shift toward grass-fed beef and organic beef. Okay, but why is that interesting? It's interesting because the people who are buying that beef are predominantly, not all urban, but politically, we have a kind of more liberal urban consumer in a relationship with typically a more conservative uh, rancher. And so if you go to farmer's markets all over the West, you'll find this kind of curious dynamic where, you know, whatever you think of partisanship, you know, this is a place where people can still get together and talk over beef. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wait, what's the beef? Yeah. I don't know whether this falls in there at all or not. Eminent domain. Is that, is that, does that play a part in anything of land that those? United States has possession of and whatever. Yeah, so um, eminent domain, the power of government, state or federal government to take land, even against your wishes. And the constitution, uh, US constitution does imply that the federal government has that power. The only restriction is you have to be compensated. So if government takes your property, you have to be given fair compensation for it. 
Uh, the thing about eminent domain is that no government wants to use it. It is politically just, you know, explosive. And so the places where I know it's been used for federal lands are creation of certain national parks. And it's typically um, like in the Shenandoah National Park, these, this was a poor community. The federal government could go in. Uh, this is also the 30s. And, um, but in the case of most federal lands, the federal agencies have money. Actually, Congress has appropriated considerably more that they can buy land for habitat protection if there's really important land, but they can only buy it from willing sellers. So they, they really, in the case of federal lands, it's just rarely exercised. Right now, where it is being exercised has nothing to do with public lands. One of the big debates is the border wall um, because, you know, fence needs to go in a certain place and property owners are gonna sell their land or it's gonna be taken and they'll be paid. And then the people who are really upset are the people who that happens to and what's left of their property is on the south side of the wall, which happens. So but yeah, it's a great question. Uh, yeah, very unpopular. So it doesn't play well in, in Congress. All right, well, I'll move through a couple things and then um, see if there are more questions. I do think recreation is gonna continue to be um, a significant challenge and point of debate within federal land management. Uh, and I'll start with this, this might seem like an odd graph, but it's thinking about there have been waves of kind of recreation, there have been recreation booms in the 20th century where all of a sudden the agencies are facing this flood of tourists and they're not equipped either in infrastructure or personnel to handle it. The first real wave comes in the 1950s and I put this graph up because this is the, uh, you know, in 2004 dollars, this is the median family income in the United States, 1947 to 2005. What you're seeing here is this explosion of the middle class, you know, from 1947 uh, to 1967, median family income doubles. You add to that cars, in the 1950s, um, parks and forests just saw this surge of visitors. Uh, so I'll give you just two of these systems. National park visits in one decade, 1950 to 60, went from 33 to 79 million. National forest visitation tripled, 27 to 93 million in one decade. And it led to, I don't think I put pictures in here, but it led to, you know, all the problems you might be familiar with today, overcrowded parking lots, overflowing toilets. And the federal government invested several billion dollars over the 1960s to sort of expand the infrastructure to handle that many people. Um, the problem, and maybe you've heard about this, is that Congress did not continue investing billions of dollars. And so in my lifetime, I was born in 1974, in my lifetime, uh, the maintenance backlog, I mean, this sort of crumbling infrastructure has grown to $19 billion. And that comes at a time when, Oh no, here we go. See, the 1950s, it was a simpler time. Everything was in black and white. People were happy. Even the, even the dog looks content. And this is the overcrowding you might've found. But here's today. Now in 2021, the National Park Service saw 325 million, and I should, I should qualify this. That's 325 individual visits to the parks. So if someone's doing a tour, every park they stop at counts. So it's not necessarily 325 unique people, but 325 million visitors. And the National Forest Service in 2020, 168 million visitors. Now this boom was already happening before COVID. But if you remember, when we went into lockdown, people were like, hey, the outdoors are kind of nice. Um, every, I mean, it seemed like every third person I met was building out a van. Um, you know, they, they were gonna go and do the outdoor life. And so I mentioned earlier that on national forests and public lands, you can camp wherever you want. But there are spaces now where um, Flathead National Forest, west of Glacier, a friend of mine was there last summer, couldn't find a park, a place to park his truck because it's just packed. And so I think the agencies are gonna wrestle with, you know, you have a few options. One is to just limit the visitors. Say we have too many, we need to have fewer. The other is we need to expand the infrastructure so that it can handle this. 
and what will happen is somewhere in between. I didn't put a slide up, but in 2020, miraculously, something passed with broad bipartisan support in Congress. It was the Great American Outdoors Act. And over five years, it's allocating $1.9 billion a year for maintenance backlog. So the agencies are currently in a mode of really trying to not build new infrastructure, but just try to repair what's there. And then the other thing is places like Yosemite, um, which is a great gift. In COVID, the park shut down at first, and then many of them, out of COVID precautions, limited entrance. So they had kind of, you had to buy an entrance ticket. And then many of us said, wow, that was great. I could find a parking space. So some parks like Yosemite now have a visitor cap and you have to reserve an entrance to the park. Um, so we're gonna, the agencies are gonna continue to wrestle with this. The other thing that's gonna happen is that visitation is gonna go increasingly to public lands managed by BLM because as I emphasized earlier, there are no fences, there are no rangers. Um, and so we'll see how eventually Congress and the agency responds to that. Uh, I'll go through these kind of quickly. The, the, the second one, I probably won't get beyond this because this is a cluster of issues, but the basic issue of climate change is you know, running straight through all of the challenges of managing federal land. I started yesterday with the Park Service talking about how initially its idea of preservation was stasis. How do we keep things from not looking different? And that the agency began to accept a more complex view of nature as managing processes, you know, accepting that the landscapes might look different over decades. Um, but now climate change is already, not just in the future, is already kind of accelerating that change and importantly, accelerating it maybe in ways that the agency and you and I don't wanna see. So putting the agencies under pressure to change their management to mitigate climate change. So we're looking at here uh, temperatures in the contiguous 48 states over a 120 year period. And um, I won't go through all of it, but you can see you know, in the last 40 years, there's been a fairly, if we look at the trend line, uh, a significant rise. Temperatures have risen 1.2 degrees on average over the last century in the United States. And that's not a lot, but, but it changes things dramatically. Think about this. Um, California's water source, the way they store water, they have reservoirs for the wet water, but their biggest reservoir is snowpack in the Sierra. So every drop that falls as rain rather than snow heads right to the ocean and doesn't stay in the mountains. Um, this already is going to impact and probably eliminate uh, salmon habitat on a lot of the Columbia River. So these are changes that are happening. They're changes that are coming. Um, now, what's interesting is precipitation is, is all over the place. And this, this is what models predicted. If we look at the eastern half of the United States, because this is the average for the whole, and you can see wet years, dry years, wet years, dry years, but over the last century, if we look at change, the eastern half of the United States is getting more water. The west, and particularly the southwest, is getting less water. Um, so if we zero in on the southwest, you can see on the right, temperatures are going up. Um, and precipitation recently, if you see the trend line there, over the last 30 years, precipitation has gone down. Now, not to historic lows. Um, this can come up again, but the understanding, or at least the predictive modeling says it's going to continue to drop. So what does that mean for us? Well, uh, it means, I should have more time to describe these maps. Uh, what you have right here is a map of what are called ecoregions. So it's big areas where each one of these colors signifies kind of a common precipitation and temperature regime. And also what's signified even more are the, is the vegetation in each of these zones. So you're gonna have, you know, here in Michigan, we have mixed hardwood conifer forests in the lower part of the lower peninsula, conifer forests in the north. And all of these boundaries are moving. So uh, not moving consistently in, in terms of shrinking or enlarging, it depends on where you are in the country, 
But think about the significance of this for let's say things you might go to a national park to see. Um, if we look here, I don't have a laser pointer, but if you look at, here we go, this strip right here is the Sierra Nevada mountains. You see, I keep coming back to that. Um, Sierra Nevada mountains, uh, May of 21, I was in Sequoia National Park with a class. We met with their head of research, who's sort of the preeminent Sequoia ecologist in the world. Um, and we had a great afternoon with him. We had all kinds of conversation. And the last question a student asked him, climate change. What's that mean for giant sequoias? He said, well, and a real kind of matter of fact, real scientific. He just said, well, uh, all the mature ones will be gone in 50 to 100 years, period. And the reason for that is as the temperatures increase, precipitation decreases, those sequoias, which currently grow between 4,000 and 8,000 feet, their range is going to go up in elevation. So five to nine, six to 10. And so his prediction is the species will survive. There will be giant sequoias as a sequoia, I don't remember Latin. Uh, the species will be there, but all the ones that you go to see, you know, that are 2,000 years old, those will all be dead. And the agency, uh, Park Service is struggling with that because right now um, they're losing record number of sequoias each year to fire. And the expectation is that will go on. Uh, or other places. I mentioned Pelican Island, the very first um, National Wildlife Refuge. It's a five acre island. Uh, but by, I think it was 2015, uh, it was down to two and a half acres because the sea level rose, storm surge comes in, uh, erosion increases, it's just getting smaller. And this is particularly important, oops, I don't have a map of it, for the national wildlife refuges, sea level rise. Because if you remember the number of them that are on the coasts, they're about protecting wetlands for, wide, um, for migratory birds. Sea level has come up six to eight inches in the last century, and it's expected by the end of the century we'll see another six inch rise. Well, again, those wetlands are at this, this level where the fresh and salt water mix hits in a certain way. Um, and I met with a, the head of a wildlife refuge on the San Francisco Bay, and he says at the end of the century, the entire refuge will be underwater. So the agencies are struggling with where do we decide we're gonna maybe build a seawall or protect it and through engineering, and where do we just accept that we're gonna lose this land? Um, if you, after Hurricane Katrina, the Army Corps of Engineers went into towns and said, any town over 50,000 people, we will not just rebuild your storm protection, we'll increase it so that you can withstand a, a Category five hurricane. Any town less than 50,000 people will just rebuild. And it's the Army Corps of Engineers saying to people in the Mississippi Delta, listen, we can't save you all, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna build up infrastructure to protect some towns, not others. And I think the Fish and Wildlife Service is wrestling with that. Um, this is more just what you go to see, you know, losing glaciers. Uh, I, it's funny, I had a, a friend who said his grandmother told him, his grandmother was 92, and, and she said, Brian, I, I really want to get to Glacier National Park because I want to see it before the glaciers are gone. She was 92. And Brian thought about it for a minute and just said, okay. He didn't, he didn't think he needed to tell her that, you know, you're probably going first. But uh, <laughs> Glacier National Park, you could go to the North Cascades, anywhere in the United States uh, with glaciers. You can go to Alaska. Um, you know, these are, there are dramatic changes taking place in these landscapes, and there are ecological issues with that, but there are also, look, these are places that Americans go to see, or tourists go to see, that are, the, the object of their interest will be gone. Uh, one of the more interesting things, here's another messy map, um, this is a seed zone map. Why is that interesting? Because the Forest Service, their rule has rule of thumb has always been plant local. So if you go all through this area, I mean, north to south, you're going to find ponderosa pine. But the variety that grow in New Mexico 
are adapted to that climate. The ones that grow in northern Idaho are adapted to that climate. So what the Forest Service has always said is you just you get seeds from the local area because they're the ones that are going to do best. What they're saying now and what they're experimenting with is how many zones south should we plant? So in other words, if you're planting in Michigan, well, maybe we shouldn't plant, well, we don't have ponderosa so much, but we, maybe we shouldn't plant what's local to us. Maybe we should go one growing region south because in a hundred years, the climate these trees are gonna be in is gonna look a lot more like that than it looks like our present condition. So the agencies are working to mitigate that. Sorry, I have to skip biodiversity. I wanna end on uh, wildfire because this is an issue that is getting enormous attention. Uh, and I should add that what gets most of the attention are forest fires. The reason for that is that they last a really long time. So there's plenty of time to rush out there and get photos. So it might be months. Grassland fires are really significant, particularly in the Intermountain West, but they happen pretty quickly. And so they just don't get the same attention. But wildfire. Um, wildfire in the United States, most of the nation's landscape is fire prone. Our vegetation has adapted to wildfire over millions of years. And well, I guess with the last ice age, not millions in Michigan, but my point is still the same, that vegetation has adapted to this. And if you look back in the early 20th century, uh, probably the, the long historic average over millennia is 30 to 40 million acres of land in the US probably burned each year. And here in Michigan, if you go to prairies, the reason that's important is that uh, our native plants have deep, deep root systems. So when a fire comes through and burns the above ground, the plant has plenty of resources to regrow. And so what that did is those fires are what kept the forests at bay, what kept other species at bay. Um, and this drop that you see, really interesting drop, is basically when the federal government decided fires are bad, let's get rid of them. And we did. Um, I mean, wildland firefighting, federal firefighting was remarkably successful. And so we went from a high, you know, 50 million acres down to, you know, eh, it's sort of two, three, five uh, for most of the 20th century. I mean, sorry, most of the second half of the 20th century. So sometimes people will say, you know, Jamie, only 10 million acres burned this year. That's a lot less than the historic average. But here's the interesting thing. If you look at this uptick over the last 20 years in particular, um, and so now we're you know, going down from five to 10 as the high, that's with all the same fire suppression efforts, and that's with better technology to fight fires. Um, so fire has become a real control issue. It's become a significant ecological issue, and it's become a huge economic issue. Um, if you look around the country, um, these three regions are defined, the way the boundaries are drawn is because fire behavior is much different. There really isn't, there aren't a lot of fires today of any size in the Northeast. So it's the Southeast and the West, and most of what you read on the news are Western fires, including Alaska. Um, let me go. So let me skip that and, and I'll point to this interesting relationship and to what is a problem um, in wildfire behavior and wildfire management. That graph on the left shows the number of fires each year, 1985 to the present. And you'll notice that that number, roughly stable, it's gone down a little. We're not having more fires. In fact, in the last 20 years, we've had fewer. But if you look at the graph on the right, this is the area burned, the number of acres burned, and that trend line is clearly up. So we're having the same or fewer fires burning more acres. And the reason for that is we're having more and more what would often be called catastrophic fires. Bunch of reasons for that that I ran out of time for, but they include those decades of fire suppression, 
So we have fuel building up on the forest floor. The fires are more intense. We have the last 20 years of really high temperatures and drought in the Southwest. So that um, the, the big fires that are burning today are not what you would think of as the normal fire regime. Um, so instead of just burning along the ground and burning up dead fuels and lower shrubs and trees, the fire is getting 300 feet into a sequoia. The fire is burning up all of the organic matter in the soils so that it's hard for vegetation to regrow. And then here's the bigger problem when it comes to human interests. More and more, we are building homes in fire-prone landscapes. I mean, we build homes in hurricane-prone landscapes, floodplains, uh, but there has been an explosion of growth in homes throughout the country, but particularly in the West, and what they call the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface. Um, here you have a whole community surrounded by trees, but if you, I was just near uh, Breckenridge and Aspen recently, and if you look at the homes up by the ski slopes, well, someone wants, you want five acres, 20 acres in the forest. Of course you do. It's beautiful. Um, but so as fires become more intense, one of our problems is more property and more people are in the path of wildfires. And so if you look at this map, here we have a map showing the percentage of homes uh, in the wildland urban interface. And you can see some of these states, right? Montana, Wyoming, New Mexico, 60% of homes. The national average is that 33% of homes are in this wildland urban interface, many of them at extremely high risk. And so if you heard about the Paradise Fire, it was the, the name of the fire was the Camp Fire, Paradise, California in 2018, killed 85 people, destroyed 18,800 structures, most of them homes, with the total losses, so this isn't firefighting costs, total losses of economic value, $16.5 billion. Now that's extreme, but the concern is how do we deal in a changing climate that's getting hotter and drier? How do we deal with this reality? And what that means for the federal land agencies that all have firefighting capabilities is that they are spending more and more money. Because even if the, most fires actually start on private land and then burn into federal land, but the agencies have cooperative agreements with states and municipalities. So they're working on firefighting and increasingly they're having to put more into fighting fires because of life and property being at risk. So um, the first billion dollar fire year, um, actually it's before this, uh, the first $2 billion fire year was actually a year I fought fire with the Forest Service. That was in 1997. Uh, the 10 year average is now $2.4 billion just for fire suppression, not for anything else. And if you look down here at the bottom, it's really difficult to estimate total economic losses because that would include homes, lost wages, um, health impacts from smoke. Um, the range is very wildly, but this is the annual, this is from the Congressional Budget Office, they're the most conservative estimate that the costs are 37 to $80 billion a year in damage from wildfires. And I'll end with this one. Uh, I was saying that we have these big catastrophic fires. Those are the ones that cost, that, that are really dramatically raising the totals. Um, the Dixie Fire, which started just add, I left that area, but it wasn't me, I assure you. The Dixie Fire burned almost a million acres. It's the second largest fire in California history. And that one fire cost $637 million to put out. And so going forward, I think the fire is actually a, a really positive area, wait for it, in that this is, is actually relatively bipartisan. Most people, particularly in the West, recognize it's a problem. The partisan uh, divide really comes in how people recommend we deal with it. There are different emphases, but this is an area I think where we are seeing some political cooperation to try to address. Um, oh, and I'll, uh, and I'll end with this one because it's cool. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, the federal agencies, when they would hire planes and pilots to drop water on fires, 
it was just anyone who had a plane. So there's a lot of like World War II vintage old planes. There were a bunch of disasters, uh, crashes in the 90s. So the federal government revamped. Um, they have new safety requirements and they are looking for cost effective ways to fight fire. And that means if you've seen those planes dropping fire retardant, the red stuff, um, those planes are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, this is the biggest, the global super tanker. I think there are six of these. It is a 747, right? Two-decker plane. It can candle about 20,000 gallons of fire retardant, which it can drop in 15 seconds. But it costs $250,000 a day. One of those drops is, I mean, they're only getting a few drops in. So one of those drops is probably $75,000. Um, if you're ever in Boise, Idaho, go to the airport and the interagency fire center, and you'll probably see those. This time of year, though, they're all in Australia, so they'll be back in June. All right, well, let me stop. I'm sorry that I went over time. I, I'm not in a rush, so if anyone would like to stay and chat, um, I'd be happy to. But for those who need to leave, please do. Um, uh, remember, please, the survey that came to you two days ago. Ian reminds us that that's our duty to complete. Um, otherwise, we thank you for your attention and thank you to Dr. Skillen for an excellent presentation. Thank you so much.